about okay. All right, good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Zach Sarkis. I'll be your host today for the uh, continuation of the New York Hemp Lab workshop series focusing on New York cannabis legalization. Um, this is number 13, if I'm not mistaken, lucky number 13. We've been going at this for at least 13 weeks straight, give or take a week that we've missed, um, at least from a consecutive perspective. Um, and today we are here to talk about taxes. Article 20-C of the MRTA, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. Um, we are so lucky to have my colleague and fellow board member of New York Kemp Lab, Jason Klimek, who is, happens to be a tax expert um, in general and specifically from the cannabis perspective. So we've got a lot to talk about. Um, it's pretty dense if we were to read through it line by line. So we're gonna keep a high level today, review generally what's in the law itself, and then do some comparative analysis uh, from other states to what we're looking down the barrel for New York State. Um, before we get too deep into it, I want to give a big shout out to our founding and sponsoring member, Harris Beach Law Firm. Uh, we're so grateful for your support through and through over these years. Um, also, a big shout out to our 2021 sponsoring members, Mad Hatter Hideaway Smoke Shop out here in Rochester and the Wagner Firm, PLLC, based out of Albany. Um, Got to give a big shout out to our Founding business members, Boylan Code, Attorneys at Law, Cannamill, the New York Cannabis Growers and Processors Association, Singer Farm Naturals, Forefathers Innovation, Tracy Jong Law Firm, Closed Loop Systems, and Dawson Law Firm. And a big thanks to our 2021 business members, Hellendale, Dermatology and Medical Spa, Beacon Skiff Apple Orchards, No Wave, Plant Science Labs, the EFPR Group, and CBRE. So Jason, give us, um, as we start getting the, the document ready in the background, what are we looking at today from a legal language perspective, you know, from the 20-C, Article 20-C, as well as, you know, what we'll get into after that, looking at the, the slides you prepared. So the MRTA amends the, the tax law to add 20-C that talks about the cannabis taxation, uh, and it implements the the, the tax regime that you know was passed this this THC excise tax plus the uh, flat called sales tax retail tax however you want to look at it um, and all the implementing ideas one of the things that you know we can keep an eye out because honestly I haven't looked specifically at this point yet was is whether or not they decoupled from the federal law so part of the issue at the federal level is you have this tax called or this code section 280e that says if you traffic in a controlled substance can schedule one or schedule two controlled substance you are denied all deductions except cost of goods sold so for like a dispensary it's a killer because you your cost of goods is the cannabis that you buy your rent utilities wages insurance whatever those are not cost of goods. Those are sales related expenses and those are not deductible. So, you know, to give an easy example, you make hundred dollars in revenue. You have $60 of cost of goods. That's what you paid for the cannabis. And then you have $20 of all those other expenses. So in a normal business at the end of the day on that hundred dollars of revenue, you'd have $20 of profit. So you, if we just said you had a flat 20% tax rate, you'd pay $4 to the IRS. But 280E says that $20 that you deducted for other expenses, you can't deduct that. So the IRS looks at it like you have $40 of profit and you're taxed, you're taxed if this 20% flat tax, you're taxed on eight or your tax rate or the, the amount you owe is $8. So that's, it becomes a very difficult, um, very difficult tax to deal with because even though the IRS says you have $40 in profit, you really have $20. So you just paid $8 in taxes on $20 of profit. Um, that's, that's a huge amount as compared to $4. <laughs> um, so that's why 280E is very difficult. And if New York, in New York in general matches the federal law and where they don't, they specifically call it out. So if New York did not call out that we are decoupling from the federal law for this purpose, there's the argument that it's the same deal. Like you have to pay 
or you, you don't get uh, your deductions, your normal business deductions. So you got my uh, hand raised, Jason. Uh, oh, go ahead. So from where would we find that decoupling? Like where would you it would be use it? in the law? And 20-C, so, yep. Yep. Uh, so we need to keep an eye out for that because I have not come across that yet. Um, but it's important. And that's a thing that, you know, maybe if it's not in there, we need to go back to the legislature and say, hey, you need to add this amendment. Do you want these businesses to fail? Because they're already facing a 70 to 90% federal tax rate. So would it say then, uh, like we choose to decouple from 280E or would it say no, something more general? Like, you know, we will treat uh, regular business deductions as deductible or something like that. Like, I don't know what law or what language they would actually put in there, but got it. it's cool. one of the issues that's coming up. And, you know, we've been also, I actually spent this morning talking about taxation um, and cannabis. So we can have a good discussion today because this is, this is relevant to every business owner. This is definitely where um, there's a lot of concern because New York's tax rates are already high um, and 280E makes it even worse. Hmm. Well, yeah, let's jump in then. Um, so we want to start with kind of high level. Um, you know, it gets pretty dense through here. And I think when it comes to describing the adult use tax on cannabis products, the slides you put together make for the most reasonable description and depiction of, of what we face. Um, but definitely follow, happy to follow your lead as we begin to kind of look through these. Um, so section 492 is the definition, 493 is imposition of tax. Uh, you know, there's registration renewal with regards to taxing, um, return of payment and payment of tax records to be kept and penalties, returns to be kept to be secret, um, and administrative provisions and illicit cannabis penalty. Um, so yeah, Jason, let's follow your lead here on what we should begin to break down, which we should skip over here. So uh, I think it's important to look at because these have tax implications, what is meant by edible, flower, and concentrate. So that's a C, D, and E, because yep. each of those comes with a different tax rate. Yep. Um, so edible products means a product containing either cannabis or concentrated cannabis and other ingredients intended for use or consumption through ingestion, including sublingual or oral absorption. So it's very general, broad definition that pretty much includes anything you would think that is an edible, um, including yep. tinctures. Um, I got to say, welcome, Mary Kruger, uh, executive director from Rock Normal. She just joined on. She's been with us the past for months now, helping kind of facilitate this conversation. So welcome, Mary. Appreciate you being here. Hello, Zach. Hello, Jason. Thank you. Okay, then we jump to D, cannabis flower, means the flower of a plant of the genius cannabis that has been harvested, dried, and cured, but has not undergone any processing whereby plant material is transformed into a concentrate, including but not limited to concentrated cannabis or into an edible or topical product containing cannabis or concentrated cannabis and other ingredients. Cannabis flower excludes leaves and stem. And then concentrated cannabis throws us back into uh, section three of the cannabis law um, in their definition sections, but you know, it's, it's what we've discussed before. It's the extracts. Yep. Um, and so again, the reason that those are important, as you'll see in the section that Zach just highlighted, there's different tax rates. Um, but the other one I want to hit is illicit cannabis. So illicit cannabis is not the same. It is defined specifically for the um, the tax law, it's not necessarily the same as the penal law, although they do mention the penal law, but it has a very specific definition under the tax law, and that it means that it includes flower, concentrate, edible, and cannabis plant, on which any tax required to have been paid under this chapter has not been paid. So that's what illicit cannabis means for this portion. Um, and that's where we'll see the penalties come in at the end. Uh, and then just you know, sale means the transfer of title, position, or both exchange or barter, rental, lease, or license to use or consume, conditional or otherwise, in any means 
in any manner or by any means whatsoever for consideration or agreement, therefore. So it's not gifting. Gifting means you have donative intent, meaning you're giving somebody with something with no conditions whatsoever. Uh, that's gifting. So it's not gifting if you say, I'll give you some cannabis if you paint my house. That is, that's bartering. Um, so it's just important to understand because sale obviously has implications under the tax line. Um, cool. And then just remember what total THC is. It's it's delta nine plus THCA, and that's important because again, it's another calcul. It's it's used in the calculus to determine the tax rate. Mm -hmm. So right. should we then go into the imposition of tax? Yeah, because that's where the tax is. Perfect. So basically, this is what it is. So we have two kind of taxes in New York with the cannabis tax. We have the excise tax, which is paid by the retailer to the distributor. And then we have the retail tax, which is taking place of the sales tax and it's 13%. So the excise tax is for cannabis flower, it's five tenths or one half of a cent per milligram of, TH, of total THC in a product. Um, so five tenths, it's five tenths of one cent per milligram of the amount of total THC, and that's for flour. Yep. For concentrated cannabis, so your vapes, distillates, things like that, it's eight tenths of one percent or of one cent for uh, per milligram of total THC. And then for edible, this is where they definitely went off the rails, in my opinion, a little bit. It's three cents per milligram of total THC. So those are the, particularly the edible one is fairly high tax rate. And the, the, the reason for this, according to the governor's office and those who implemented this, and it's right in the, I think the governor's bill in the preamble um, where they say it is for, it is to promote temperance in the consuming of cannabis. Now, we have in many, many, many times referenced the similarities between the cannabis law and the alcohol law. A lot of times, you know, if we don't necessarily know what might happen under the cannabis law, we can sometimes look to the alcohol law because they took a lot of stuff from that. That was kind of the concept here is in their minds, and this is actually, I did look up some studies, so it is, there is actual data to back this up, with alcohol, if you charge more for higher proof alcohol, you reduce consumption um, or at the very least reduce intoxication because think about it this way. If you have the choice between four shots and four beers, each containing the same amount of alcohol, but the shots are called twice as expensive as the beers, maybe you're inclined to consume the beers and by and large, most people are not gonna consume four beers in the time it takes you to consume four shots. Therefore, sure. you're getting less intoxicated because it takes you longer to consume the beers, therefore less intoxication. Your body has more time to break it down. However, my belief, I don't think there's really any data on this, but my belief is that does not hold the same for cannabis. Because if you take the ratios of, let's say you have a 20% THC flower and an 80% vape cartridge, that means that like to get roughly the same hit or the same equivalent THC dosage, you need to take four hits of flour per one hit of vape cartridge. I mean, four hits of flour, that's not the same as consuming four beers. That's, you know, a minute or two's worth versus four beers, if you're not like funneling them, is probably going to be, you know, more along the lines of an hour uh, if you're drinking relatively fast. So, I don't think the rationale necessarily holds up. In my opinion, it, it kind of punishes half the market because you have half the market's flower, half the market is other. And so it's kind of punishing that half of market and it's the government picking and choosing the winner. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think it's great. It's also fairly unique. The only thing that's even close to this is um, Illinois has a THC tax, but theirs is more general. Theirs basically says, if it's more than 35%, you're at one tax rate. If it's below, you're at another. And if you're edible products, 
you're at kind of this middle tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. So theirs is less like a THC tax, although it technically is, but it just breaks it up into above and below 35%. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and just, it's interesting, I mean, from the consumer perspective, you know, anyone who's consumed edibles before, it takes longer for those to affect you, right? Like, it, uh, it isn't as immediate as if you inhale, mm -hmm. uh, if you smoke or vape. And so it's just interesting that there's this, this, I don't know discrimination against edible products where like if they're if they're aiming for uh trying to curb people over consuming i mean edibles are one way to over consume but who's to say you can't do that through inhaling or other methods i don't know it, just, it doesn't make sense they don't understand that cannabis is different from alcohol and jason i think you're right like that was their thought process in this but it's uh this is a shitty part of the bill. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mary, you're hundred percent right. Uh, saying that they don't understand cannabis because this part was not written by the legislature. This part was basically written by the governor and then adopted by the legislature. And I would say that the people writing this from the governor's office don't really understand. And this was advocated by NYCGPA and things like that. Of This doesn't work. You don't understand how cannabis is not alcohol. So we can't treat it for tax purposes like alcohol. Um, that did not win out. Basically, mm -hmm. I think it sounded kind of like that, you know, and this is my experience too of meeting with people in government talking to this is there's a very, very fi finite amount of people who want to and understand digging into the tax provisions. So I think, you know, there were certain people in the governor governor's office who wanted this the legislature got a lot of what it wanted in the bill, social equity and stuff. So they just said, fine, we don't care about the taxes. That's not our bag. Do what you want to do. And I think that's how we ended up with, I'm just going to say the worst tax provision in the nation. Mm. Uh, that's my personal opinion, but I bet it'll kind of come out in the numbers too. Mm. Uh, so okay. we jump we jump down to B here. We did section A, which talks about the different tax rates, and then there's an additional tax rate. So you want to take it from here, Jason? Yep. So we have the excise tax that's paid by the retailer from the distributor. So when they're getting the product, they're also paying this retail tax. Or sorry, excise tax. Now we get to a tax that instead of paying the sales tax that we're all used to, you know, roughly eight percent statewide. Um, we now have this 13% total tax, but first we'll talk about part of that. So it's 9%. So 9% flat tax is paid by the consumer to the retail dispensary, well, collected by the retail dispensary. And that goes right to the state. That is the state's portion of the retail tax. The state also gets the excise tax, by the way. Um, and then... We go on to the next one. Uh, there's a 4% retail tax. So there's 9%, 4%, it's 13% total. Why did they break it up this way? Because it's all about where it's allocated. So the 9% goes to the state. The 4% stays with the municipality. And this was kind of the carrot um, for municipal opt or remaining in the law not opting out uh, because of that 4%, 1% goes to the, well, this is all predicated on staying in. If you opt out, if like an entire county's municipalities opt out, nobody gets anything in that county. But assuming like in Rochester, if just the city stayed in, the county would get 1% of that 4% and the remaining three would stay with the city. But it gets more interesting the way it starts to get allocated. So that 1% is always going to go to the county. But then let's say that you have the city of Rochester and you have Brighton. And the city of Rochester has 10 dispensaries and Brighton has one dispensary. And the city of Rochester generates 10 times the revenue in sales than the dispensary in Brighton. That 3% gets allocated both to the city and Brighton except it gets allocated at a 10 to one ratio because they allocate it based on how much revenue 
that municipality generated. So the law kind of encourages municipalities to have a bunch of dispensaries because the more they have, the more allocation they get, which also makes sense. I mean, if they have more dispensaries, they should get a bigger portion because that was them generating that revenue. Um, and I think that's covered a little later on, but that's basically how the taxes work. Um, so maybe before we go into the next portions, which is more of the administrative stuff, do we wanna to switch to the other slides? Because I have some uh, examples to kind of make all of this a little bit more understandable. Yeah, absolutely. Say. Let me um, just see if I can. Jason, did I understand correctly that all of the tax, so that 4% that stays local, does that all go to the county and then they distribute it, that 3% to the cities or does it go directly to the cities? I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head, like the intermediate steps, but the county keeps 1% and then the 3% get allocated out okay. to the municipalities. So somebody's got to be doing that tallying. It so probably either is the with the county. It's probably, yeah, it's probably the county who's doing all the math and then sending it back out to the municipalities mm -hmm. is my guess. Um, if it's not covered in the law, that could be regulation. Um, okay, so here are some examples and let me do some explaining because it because there's two pictures here. One is the tax rates and the other is the wholesale costs and both are incredibly important. So this top the uh, section. So what I did is I broke it out to flour, cartridges or concentrates and gummies. Now the wholesale cost may seem high to people and this is assuming a 20% flour. So one, one gram of flour, 200 milligrams of THC is 20%. So the wholesale cost might seem high at $8.05. Where I got that from, that's the average of Massachusetts and Illinois. So it's actually realistic. It's not me picking an uh, unrealistic number. Um, if we were out west, as you'll see on the next slide, you'll see what the, the prices are compared to. Suffice to say, it's a lot lower out west. So if we go through the math, we see that there's a half a cent tax uh, per milligram of THC, which means that there's a $1 wholesale excise tax. So that means that the dispensary gets charged by the distributor $9.05. So now we assume that there's going to be a 100% retail markup. So they're doubling the price at retail to sell it. So if they do that, that's $18.10. When you apply the 13% sales tax, you get a retail sales tax of $2.35. Add that all together your cost per gram at retail, if I am the end consumer after tax, I'm paying $20.45. So that's roughly a $70 eighth. And that's a 27%-ish tax rate. Um, interestingly, because we're dealing with rates, if you lower the wholesale cost, the tax rate goes down, but the cost goes down as well. Or, sorry, the tax rate goes up tax rate goes up, but the cost goes down because the taxes are a larger portion of the, the rate of, of the wholesale cost, but the, the price goes down as we'll kind of see later on. Um, and then what I did for cartridges and gummies is those are wholesale costs from, um, that's the average throughout the country. We looked at some wholesale numbers and just I just averaged them. So that's what they are. So when you run those averages through all the tax rates in New York, you come up with those tax percentages, about 50% for cartridge or concentrates and about 55% for gummies. Um, and those are your retail taxes. So a, a one gram cartridge that contains 80% THC would be about 60 bucks. Now, if that's the case, Obviously that's higher than the illicit market, but you're also not getting things like vitamin E acetate, um, but also lower than the medical, like a half gram at medical, at least in Rochester is between 60 and $70. So, you know, you're definitely lower on the adult use side 
um, than medical for the cartridge based on that wholesale cost. If the wholesale cost goes up because wholesale is just more expensive in New York, obviously that price goes up. If it's, if it's like flour, double it, you know, mm. maybe it's, maybe it's a hundred dollars or $120 per gram. So can um, we do one, one more walkthrough just from the, the gram of flour? Like we just take it try. So you got your, your flour product. It's one gram. It's 200 megs of THC. Which and, means it's 20% THC flour. Yep. And that means, you know, times a fifth of, of one cent or half of 1%. Half of one cent. Cent. Yeah. So that's like, you know, it's a yeah. dollar. Great. And yep. then the, so that's a dollar tax per gram wholesale cost based off standards that we'd seen um, across, was that based, the wholesale cost was out of what we've seen. So the wholesale is the average of Illinois and Massachusetts wholesale rates. Great. And then dispensary. So that means the dispensary is paying $9 and five cents to get that gram. Right. That's um, the $8 and five cent wholesale cost plus the yeah. $1 tax. And the retail tax is just at the, that is the flat rate tax that we'll get no matter what for one gram that's, of flour. That's the 13% tax based on taking that dispensary cost right there yep. and marking it up by a hundred percent or doubling it. Got so it. you're at 1810 times 13% is $2.35. No, got that. And then of course, you know, like you know, a traditional markup between a distributor and retailer is anywhere between 30 and 50% in a traditional market. And cannabis is not a traditional market in general. And these kind of markups are pretty damn standard. So and yeah, important. because remember 280E on the federal side crushes you in taxes. So the retailers need to have a bigger margin because the federal tax law eats away at so much of it as compared to a normal business. So yeah, that a hundred percent markup may sound ridiculous, but when you talk to dispensary owners, 50 to a hundred percent is more is standard and not 30 to 50%. Totally. Yep. Great. Appreciate that breakdown. Um, do you want to say anything more about the, this lower section down here? Yeah. So the reason I put this here is because I wanted to compare that if we used the wholesale cost of flour that I used up here, the eight dollars and five cents, and we ran it through those states' tax rates, those are the prices of a gram at retail. So in California, if you run, if you assume a wholesale cost of $8.05, 100% retail markup, you get a retail price of $21.76 per gram and an effective tax rate of 35. And we can go down the line and see, if you assume the same thing as we did for New York, you just substituted those states' tax rates that's what you get. So I wanted to give some kind of comparison. So if that was all true, and that was what was happening across the country, New York would fall kind of in the middle at 27%. We're, you know, at the higher end of average, maybe, or not even really. I mean, Washington 37, you know, Nevada 35, California 35, Colorado 32. So, you know, we're really not out of the average. However, that is not realistic. And if you want to flip to the next slide, we'll see why. So here are the actual wholesale costs. These are just averages. So, you know, obviously there's going to be higher grade things that are more, lower grade things that are less. This is just the average. So California, you have $3.71. Oregon, $2.20 per wholesale gram. Now, when you run through their tax rates, I just skipped that step. So between the, the wholesale cost column or row and the retail cost, I did the tax calculations, same assumptions, 100% retail markup, blah, blah, blah. In California, because they're low wholesale cost, you get a $10.51 gram at retail. That's what you're paying as the consumer. In Nevada, or sorry, in Oregon, you're paying $5.16. In Massachusetts, you're paying $20. Illinois, $19.82. And so I calculated the effective tax rates. And this is why the effective tax rate isn't necessarily the greatest metric because yeah, California, 41% taxes. Oh my God, it's so high. You're still only paying 10 bucks, 10 and a half bucks a gram, which, you know, what is that? A $40 eighth? That's not like horrific. So it's good for consumer, but not necessarily for producer or, right, or supply right, chain. Yes, yeah. getting a much lower 
uh, amount as producer. And then the bottom one is just the difference between what it is in New York and what it would be in those states. So, um, you know, all it, it literally was the New York price of whatever I calculated on the other page, $20 and change minus um, the retail cost that I calculated on this page. And that shows you the difference. So if you look, we are actually very close to Illinois and Massachusetts, but we are way off from every other state. And you can assume, not assume, I mean, it's pretty obvious. The illicit market prices are a lot closer to the retail prices in California, Colorado, so on and so forth, than they are Illinois, Massachusetts, and most likely New York. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to get across is not only is it the tax rate, yes, that is a big issue, but it's also the wholesale costs going into it that are the real driver because you're based on that wholesale cost, you're adding the taxes, you're doubling it potentially at retail, and that is a huge driver. So mm -hmm. the hopefully New York can have a lower wholesale cost, but you know we can't grow outdoors all year round. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different economics than they do out west. So you know that's why I think it's more re it's more realistic to say we'll look more like Massachusetts and Illinois. Plus, it's a newer market in New York. Like the prices are just going to be higher in the beginning, anyways, as people are figuring out their efficiencies and, and things like that. So. Um, yeah, be prepared for, I would say, relatively expensive adult use cannabis in New York because of the taxes, because of the wholesale costs and the federal tax law. I mean, these companies need to still make money um, because they're taxed on otherwise deductible expenses. And that means that, you know, their profit margins could be razor thin. And then don't forget, they're competing against the illicit market. Like, you know, maybe they would love to sell a $70 eighth. Great. Except realistically, they can't because well, it's, it's illicit market and multinational or multi-state operators. And like you look at the books of these operators, like most of them are getting floated by investor capital. Like there, oh, yeah. aren't, there aren't too many successful large scale businesses that are in the profit zone right now. But they're operating burning through cash from investors and like so as a small mid-sized business it is incredibly challenging to compete with the razor thin margins let alone with price points that are driven down by businesses operating at a loss mm -hmm. and that's where you got to get crafty as hell uh when it comes to to being a an active member within the, the plant touching asset side of the the industry and if people don't believe my numbers this is what i tell them Right now, you can walk into a medical dispensary in New York, right down over here on, you know, right in the city, and pay $45 for a, an eighth. That is a multi state operator with a completely vertically integrated business who is operating in Rochester, at the very least, a duopoly. Um, you know, it's them and MedMen. Um, and They've been in business for six, seven years. And lastly, there's only a 7% medical tax. So they have all of those factors going for them and they're hitting more or less the illicit market price. So if they are within that realm, what is the likelihood a small business can be in that realm? It's gonna be tough when you have tax rates that are three, four times higher that you have, that you are separating the businesses out so that there's a profit at every single level because you can't have vertically integrated business unless you're a micro business. Mm -hmm. um, you are smaller. You haven't had an established brand for seven years. You're not back with an investor capital. Um, these are all things that are gonna make it an uphill battle for small businesses because you know there's no way in my mind, a small business can say, can look at all of this and say, yeah, we can match the prices of a big MSO. Like, I, I don't know how you can do that um, until you figure out efficiencies. And I, I don't know. And remember, you can't make deals. You can't say to a cultivator, hey, look, give me a, a, you know, a huge discount and I will buy exclusively from you. Nope, can't do it. So uh, it, it's going to make it hard on small businesses. I mean, there's there's no question that initially small businesses are going to have to be 
pay very close attention to their cash flow, tax rates, everything like that, because yeah, the margins are just tight and you're competing against these guys who have been doing it for years with fully vertically integrated businesses backed by, as Zach said, investor capital. Truth. Um, should we bring back up the, uh, the, the, the law itself? Yeah, I think so. Great. Great. All right. Um, so we left off after section D. Um, so then we're talking about registration renewal. Um, I'll allow you to take the lead and obviously we can fast forward through anything that's, that's not essential here. Um, so this is certificate of registration. This is basically like you're going to be paying tax and co potentially collecting tax, kind of like yeah. I think a certificate of authority right now for sales tax, very similar. Now, I wonder if they'll allow us to pay our taxes, you know, because the New York State has a tax portal where small businesses can pay direct from their bank and or wherever. And like, if we can't, if you can't use cash, if, if, if we're only using cash, you can't use card, et cetera, in this industry or banking, how the hell are we going to pay taxes? Efficiently, make, effectively. Tax department. Yeah. <laughs> Just like paying your federal taxes. You're going to make a trip down to, you know, the tax assistance center or whatever and <laughs> rolling up with a sack of money and saying, here are your taxes. Um, yep. Unless they're banking options, which maybe there's a couple, but there's not too many. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's difficult. You know, your wages are going to be paid in tax or sorry, in cash. Um, your expenses are going to be paying cash. Like, I don't know about you. You, you too, but I don't pay any of my bills in cash. They're either charged to my credit card or like, I don't even know how to pay a bill in cash because you couldn't even use a check. Like sure. you literally would have to go to wherever it is and pay them cash. And sure. if they're not a local service provider, it would be difficult. Um, so yeah, always issues. Uh, let's see. I think we can, we can skip Romanet two. Uh, we can skip three. This is all just what happens if the commissioner refuses to issue you a certificate. Uh, yeah. So keep on going. Yeah, keep going. All right, uh, let's see. Revocation. Basically collect and pay the proper taxes or they'll revoke your certificate of registration, then you won't be able to operate a business. So yep. don't screw around with tax money, especially tax money that you hold for the state. Mm -hmm. That is where they get very, very edgy. Um, like with sales tax, if anybody's familiar, you hold that in trust with the state and or for the state and you have to pay it over. And <laughs> if you don't pay that tax over, there's personal liability because you're holding it in trust for the state. So um, don't screw with the state's money is really, you know, the model at the end of the day. Yep. Um, Anything you want to note in, in section D, E, or F? Not really. Uh, cool. And then we go to returns and payment of tax. So this is just when you're, when you have to pay, uh, it's quarterly, yep. end of February, May, August, November. Which is interesting. It's different than the, the calendar quarters. Hmm, that is interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, you can pay electronically to the commissioner the total amount of tax due for the period covered. That will be interesting to see how they possibly think that's going to work. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I would, I would like to see that. I mean, I don't know. Do you take your wad of cash and go purchase like a a debit uh, card yeah <laughs> like is that what you have to do maybe that is i i don't know um because you unless the bank's attitude changes i don't know how you're paying that electronically prepaid debit card yeah i think that hey maybe that's the next ancillary business yep there we go uh all right records to be kept um obviously this is just you know more track and trace making sure that you're not diverting product, and most importantly, from the state's perspective, you're not uh, reducing their tax revenue. Um, and just uh, like fa fastly, it's like you know, accurate records in such forms as the commissioner will require, including but not limited to such items that include total THC content of the adult use cannabis products sold or pro produce uh, 
or produced by such person, complete records of every retail sale of adult use cannabis and any other records or information required. So uh, a period of three years after filing the return. So that's something just to, you know, and it could be a long laundry list of things. So, you know, you, organizing your books is definitely going to be, it's going to be something, that's for sure. <laughs> yep. Uh, so everybody who needs to pay tax and doesn't, <laughs> um, will get charged $500 a month for each uh, or part thereof for which the value occurs. So basically $500 a month until you remedy it. Um, and let's see, that's pretty much it. Um, unless it's due to reasonable cause. There's always usually a reasonable cause. Um, like you relied on, like you have a, uh, service that helps you pay your sales tax and they somehow didn't for the for that you might be able to avoid the, the penalty mm. okay we relied on them and they just didn't but here's the money um so that's a reasonable cause returns to be kept secret so they're not going to start sharing these around um because the irs would probably be more interested in this data um maybe even dea so they're not going to be doing that um all secret. This is a thick section. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to go into any detail. Returns are kept secret. Good. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, see. Criminal penalties. Yeah, I think that that's. Oh, for criminal. Uh, C oh, 37 is chapter. So. Yeah, uh, that, I think just that. That's come, it's, yeah, it's coming up. Yeah. So these are the administrative provisions. I think this might be where it starts to say how it's allocated. Um, Article refund reimbursement shall be paid. Um, let me know if you need me to slow down. Yeah, hang on one second. Yeah, so in section two there, they're talking about how they allocate it back out from the commissioner. Um, and then let's see shall certify to the comptroller the amount of tax penalties and interest attributable to retail sales within a city within a population. So this is how they're accounting for um, the tax revenue collected by the state. Mm -hmm. um, and then such amount will be distributed by the comptroller to such city and such counties. Uh, such counties are shall be entitled to retain 25% of the monies so distributed such county shall distribute the remaining 75%. So that's the one in one in 3% of that 4% sales tax. Such county shall distribute the remaining 75% or 3% of the 13 of the 9% local. Uh, sorry, 4% local of such monies attributable. Where is it? Uh, so remaining 75% uh, of the monies to towns, villages, and cities within such county in which a retail dispensary is located in proportion to the sales of adult use cannabis products by retail dispensaries in such towns, villages, and cities as reported by the seed to sale tracking system. So again, like when, like they're almost saying in the law, open as many dispensaries as possible because you'll get more of that 3%. So if you wanna just trial this, yeah, you'll get a little bit, but if your town next door to you has 10 times the amount of revenue, they're getting 10 times more than you of that 3%. So it all comes back to like, what rationale beyond just, we don't want pot here, other than that's not a good rationale under the law regardless. It's, it's really, we don't want sales here. What rationale could a town have to opt out? It just, in my opinion, doesn't make sense because you can grow, you can possess, you can process, you can grow at home in a, in a place that opts out. The only thing that can't be done is retail sales, which you're just gonna go over to the next town over that does and buy it there and bring it right back. And then mm. your town doesn't get any of that sales tax revenue. Like it just does not make sense to opt out. Mm. And I mean, dispensaries are like analogous to liquor stores, but if you go out West, a lot of the dispensaries look like Apple stores. Like they're not seen. They're not like bringing in criminal elements. They're, they're nice places. Um, not to mention that because you're dealing with cash and cannabis, 
it's pretty secure. <laughs> like a lot of them have armed guards, like not unsafe place. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I don't get the rationale, but no, it's interesting. I do want to I highlight this. Like such county shall distribute the monies received for each quarter ending on the last day of February, May, August, or November to such towns, villages, and cities no later than the 13th day. So that means the counties have to give the money out within 13 days of the funds coming in. Um, which is just interesting to know. And then it begs the question, yeah, what are counties, towns, and you know, villages going to use that money for? And that's where it's up to us as individuals and stakeholders to advocate for how that money is going to be used. Vote in um, your local elections. That's, that's your voice. That is your voice. Um, all right. So illicit cannabis uh, penalty. So in addition to any oh, any other criminal penalties that may apply, any person knowing knowingly in possession or knowingly having control of illicit cannabis as defined in section 492, which is untaxed cannabis, essentially, that's been sold. And remember, um, it's any person, not any licensed person, licensed entity, any person knowingly in possession. So if you come across, if you are in possession of cannabis that you know should have been taxed, this can apply to you. Yep. Um, after notice of an opportunity for a hearing, shall be liable for civil penalty of not less not less than two hundred dollars per ounce of illicit cannabis flour, or five dollars per milligram of total weight of any illicit cannabis edible. So, how much? What markup is that? You know, uh, or fifty dollars per, per gram of total weight of any product containing concentrate. Yeah, which is that's yeah, like yeah, I'd like to see, it'd be interesting to see those numbers like from a percentage perspective. Um, trying to highlight some things that's not working, but or $50 is a per gram total weight of any product containing illicit cannabis concentrate, $500 per illicit cannabis plant. That's interesting. So $500 per illicit cannabis plant, but not to exceed $400 per ounce of illicit cannabis flour, $10 per milligram of the total weight of illicit cannabis edibles product, $100 per gram of the total weight of any product containing illicit cannabis concentrate and $1,000 per illicit cannabis plant for the a first violation um, and for a second and subsequent violation within three years following the prior violation shall be liable for civil penalty of not less than $400 per ounce of illicit cannabis flour. $10 per milligram for the total weight of illicit cannabis edible product, $100 per gram of total weight of any product containing illicit cannabis concentrate, and $1,000 per illicit plant, cannabis plant, but not to exceed $500 per ounce of illicit cannabis flour, $20 per milligram of total weight of any illicit cannabis edible product, $200 per gram of the total weight of any product containing illicit cannabis concentrate, or $2,000 per illicit cannabis plant. So that's a lot of money packed into a very dense paragraph that you probably need you know, you need an expert and a very nice graph to understand that you're going to be paying a lot of money if you get caught with anything that is illicit. And, and this is this is how, like, exclusive of the criminal law, this is how they're dealing with don't grow at home and sell. Um, gift it all you want, but the minute that you sell it, it should have been taxed, and now you're ending up right in there. So that's huge. Um Anything else we want to address in this section here? Uh, nope, not really. I mean, this is in addition to whatever other criminal or civil liability there is. Mm-hmm. So that's not just that. Um, okay, one second, hold on. The, so, where is that? Um, no, oh, keep going. That's not the section that I thought. Um, so, this act shall take effect immediately, provided, however, that sections 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, A, 8, 9, 10, 11 of this act shall expire to 14 years after the. No, it's so, not. Um, we could obviously go back and look at 1, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, that pertain to any of those things that we just read. Um, campus Control Board. And then, yeah, Section 4102, Alcoholic Beverage Control Laws Amended. No alcohol beverage retail licensee shall sell cannabis as defined in this 
in section three of cannabis law, nor have or possess a license or permit to sell cannabis on the same premise where alcohol beverages are sold. We've talked about that. Um, and then it begins to break down. Illegal drug means any controlled substance. Grade eight, one violation means possession of one quarter ounce or more, but less than four ounces. Or but this is, of, yeah, of illegal all they drugs. did here was this used to contain marijuana. Now they're and saying they removed that. we're yeah. outside of that now. Yeah, so. great. Um, yeah, so I feel like this kind of is the summary of what we've been talking about from a tax perspective. So I'm going to exit out of this unless you feel called to. Now, the only other thing, and I can't remember what section it was in, is that it explicitly says it is not subject to the normal sales tax. So it is not, um, it's not the taxes we talked about plus 8%. It is exempt from that, which thankfully that is the case. Cool. Well, there you have it again, folks. Uh, we've done, another one is in the books. Um, you know, we are basically almost complete with this entire document. Um, you know, we'll, we'll reach back out about next steps and how we're going to keep moving forward. Um, obviously, there's some updates coming in the pipeline with regards to the, uh, the new hemp regulations. You know, the comment period is now over and there's going to most likely be some kind of edits to that. So we'll be able to review that. Well, we skipped over that section um, a few sessions ago. Uh, Jason, do you got any thoughts you want to add before we, we close it for the day? Um, not related to tax per se, but one thing that honestly has come up, I don't know how many times in the last several days, like, like a number is this, these businesses popping up that are selling t-shirts, uh, and you get a free bag of wheat and, you know, under the premise that you, uh, you can gift cannabis under the law. Therefore, this is legal. You're buying the t-shirt, you're not buying cannabis and they're gifting you the cannabis. And then I have a lot of people asking me, is this legal? I don't think so. I mean, I haven't done the full analysis, um, but I think that there's probably an issue with the whole, you know, if we look through like the illicit cannabis and all this stuff, blah, 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 is that at some point it had to have been grown, which would violate the law. And at some point, like that should have been taxed. Therefore, it's illicit. Now, the real issue, though, is that the law says, and we discussed this, I think, last time, if you violate the MRTA, you can be prohibited from getting a license for up to a year. So if you're looking to get a dispensary license and you're seeing all these people doing this and you're thinking, well, maybe I should do this, just know that if it is in fact illegal and you get caught, that could jeopardize your chances for getting a license in the first year. And if you start a year late, that's 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 harder to break into the market because everybody's mm. got a year on you. So I would just you know caution people that even if somebody says maybe it is it is legal, um, if the government determines no, it's not, uh, you just basically barred yourself from a license for a year. So I would take a lot of precaution in that regard mm. um, because we don't know, you know, it's been in the law for what, three and a half, four months now. There's not really going to be court cases on it yet. Um, there's not regulators, so we can't see guidance from it. So the question is who is enforcing this stuff? And I think right now it's probably just the police would be enforcing it. Um, and I'm sure the police are just as confused about a lot of this stuff as everybody else is, you know, are they technically breaking the law if they're gifting it kind of like the Washington DC model? Mm. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of gray area. We desperately need the regulators to come in and let us know what's going on and how to interpret this stuff. Uh, and you know, still to today, we don't have regulators. They've not been appointed. We don't know who's gonna be the executive director. Um, so the legislature and the governor's office really need to kind of hurry up and get on that so that we can start understanding how this is all going to work and making sure that the businesses who want to get a license legally comply are protected because if the answer really is you can sell t-shirts and gift free weed why would you get a dispensary license like mm -hmm. you know you just don't comply with it don't have to pay the taxes and just gift free weed um 
Obviously, I don't think that could be the case, but you know, we, we need regulators to definitively come out just like they did with Delta 8 and Delta 10. You know, there was a whole bunch of, well, is it illegal? Is it not? Blah, blah, blah. The regulations came out and said, no, you can't do it. All right. Well, now we have an absolutely definitive answer. Maybe you don't like it, but we know what the answer is. We need the same thing. Mm. Appreciate that. Mary, you got any closing remarks? Um, just to add to what Jason was saying, um, I think why we saw that happen in D.C. is because I agree with what Jason said. I don't think that it's legal for folks to do that. Um, and the reason why we saw that in D.C. is because they didn't create a regulated system. They just completely decriminalized and made it legal for people to grow. And then they created this gray market because they didn't create a regulated market. So I think we will see in regulations, they'll come out and clarify that, no, that's not allowed. Uh, but just to add to that. Cool. Thanks, man. All right, y'all. Well, we'll be in touch shortly. Um, we got some other things planned. I think more of, we've been doing some round industry roundtables at a more Q&A base. We really wanted to plow through this. Uh, now it's in stone. It's in YouTube forever. Uh, the digestion of the MRTA as it stands. Um, but yeah, just stay tuned. Thanks to everyone who's still on this call. Uh, reach out to us if you got any questions and we're going to be uh, doing some fun stuff coming up shortly. So appreciate all your time. Mary, Jason, thank you so much for all your contributions. Um, and we will uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. See ya.